Welcome everyone to this webinar session today uh, with Christopher Chambers from the University of Wales. He's going to talk about registered reports in a second and I'm very, very excited for this talk and I'm very happy that you're here, Chris. Then uh, good afternoon everyone also from my side. I am now very happy to welcome our main speaker, Chris Chambers, and to give you all a short introduction. Chris Chambers has started his academic journey with a Bachelor in Behavioral Science at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. He did a PhD in experimental psychology there, and after some years as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Melbourne, he moved to Europe, first to London and then on to Cardiff where he became the head of the Kubrick Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation Group and is now professor of cognitive neuroscience. However, today we will hear more about the open science side of his work, as he is a strong advocate of reforming psychological science. With The Seven Deadly Sins of Psychology, he wrote a very successful book on the current state and problems of science, and he regularly gives talks on registered reports and open research practices and is a steering member of the UK Reproducibility Network, to name only one of the groups where he is committed. He's also an editor for three different journals, which I assume will also bring some very insightful perspective to his talk. So I will hand over the virtual mic now, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be presenting today. So I'm just going to share my screen. Brilliant. OK. Yes, so thank you for having me. Um, uh, as noted, I, I began my career sort of in psychology and, and, uh, and progressed into cognitive neuroscience. And, um, and along the way, I got quite interested in improving the standard of research in the field in, that I saw around me and the quality of the research I saw. And in particular, um, trying to create tools that can help us as individual scientists achieve um, higher levels of transparency and reproducibility that don't necessarily work against us as individuals. So, you know, tools which can help us do our best and also achieve and succeed in our academic careers um, whilst also being in the community good. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about one of those initiatives called Registered Reports. And I don't know how familiar you are generally with this, but I, I'm going, this talk is really for, for those who, who know a bit about Registered Reports, but also those who don't. So I'm going to introduce the initiative basically, but then I'm going to talk about the next step that it's taken um, in the last couple of years, which, which is called Registered Reports 2.0, or the peer community in Registered Reports. So Registered Reports um, are an answer to... Uh, the concerns we've been facing in science over the last 10 years concerning reproducibility and, and um, particularly a number of uh, major failures to replicate key findings in psychology and, and related areas. And there's been a lot written and said and speculated about the causes of irreproducibility in different settings. I think it's useful to frame um, any kind of introduction to this with a simple paradox that I think gets to the very core of why we have problems in psychology with reproducibility. And we can do this using a paradox. So I often begin by asking my audience when I'm doing a, a live talk in, in person, which part of a research study do you believe should be beyond your control as a scientist? If you think about all of the different stages that go into a research project from the uh, inception of the idea, generation of theory, planning of the study, methodology, hypotheses, all of this, um, data collection and analysis, the results themselves and the conclusions. Most of us will agree that there's one part of that that should be beyond our control if we're a, a dispassionate observer of nature, and that is the results. Uh, results should be kept at arm's length. We shouldn't ever feel pressured to um, engineer or massage our results in a certain direction, even though those pressures can exist. Um, we should be keeping our results as, uh, as separate from ourselves as possible. On the other hand, which part of a research study do you believe is most important for advancing your career? Whether that is publishing papers in um, prestigious journals, uh, obtaining grant funding, esteem, and so on. And after some consideration, many of us conclude also that this, the same answer applies. It's also the results. And this sets up, I think, a very dangerous paradox for the individual researcher from really the, the, the earliest point 
um, in my own academic career, I can remember feeling this pressure that if I wanted to be a good scientist, I shouldn't feel pressure to touch my results. I shouldn't try and get certain results. Results should be results. But at the same time, I was told really by everyone around me and all the systems around me to make sure those results are amazing if you want to progress in, in academia. If you want to publish that paper in Nature Neuroscience, there's no point you know, doing a really rigorous set of experiments and getting null results. You've got to make sure they're statistically significant, that they tell a good story and that they confirm your predictions. Now, how do we resolve this paradox? Well, I think we do. And I think what happens is the way that the way we resolve this paradox is by bending the scientific method um, as much as possible. As researchers, we put it on, we put ourselves and we put the system under great pressure to get great results. And we do this by basically taking this deductive cycle and every point within it. Um, there's a there's weak points every every time there's a change in in the um, in the practice whether it's generating a hypothesis designing a study collecting data and so on at every point in this cycle there's a vulnerability and we see uh, the problems with reproducibility be, be being reflected in certain uh, tendencies in psychology so for example replication is extremely rare at the design stage. Um, it's estimated that just one in 1,000 papers reports an independent close replication of a previous study in the field. Um, and that's looking at over 100 years of psychology research. Why is replication um, unpopular? Well, it's often seen as lacking in novelty and originality, lacking in intellectual prowess. How can I demonstrate that I am a, a brilliant scientist uh, if I'm just simply repeating what somebody else has done? And many journals in their editorial policies will champion novelty and originality and 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 uh, uh, the, the distinctive nature of the research they expect to receive in their own criteria. Moving on, um, we have problems with low statistical power. Uh, for many years now, it's been found that psychology suffers from a kind of glass ceiling of about 50% power to detect medium-sized effects, despite this being well-known and, um, and very well characterized for a very long time. And it probably arises from the pressure to produce large quantity of publications. But if you've got a limited amount of resources and you know that it's going to be difficult to publish null results, it probably makes sense from a purely gambling point of view to spread your researches, your, your resources over um, a larger number of smaller studies than to invest more in one well-defined high-powered study that could produce a negative finding. Moving on to later stages, we see problems with selective reporting of various kinds. Um, you may have heard of the term p-hacking as one approach that researchers sometimes engage in in order to um, selectively report analyses that were statistically significant. But we can also selectively report at an earlier stage in that process by collecting data in a study until statistical significance is obtained and then stopping at that point which of course violates um, the fundamental principles of, of the frequentist statistics that we commonly use. At, later on, after we've got our data, um, we often face a great deal of pressure to tell stories that confirm some kind of expectation. So even if we went into a study without a hypothesis or with a vague hypothesis, um, when we're writing up papers uh, where we often feel a need to, to show that we were right in our predictions. And this can often mean changing a hypothesis after the fact in order to uh, predict results that in fact are unexpected, or it can take a more subtle form of taking a vague hypothesis, um, which could be supported or unsupported by different aspects of the data that we collect. And then in the light of those results, refining that hypothesis so that it selectively targets the results which confirmed um, the vague prediction. And of course, this, this retrofitting, this kind of um, hindsight bias or reinventing of history uh, violates, um, it's essentially short circuits, this deductive scientific method. Finally, at the end of the process, um, we see a lack of data sharing in psychology. Most researchers don't voluntarily share their data unless they're required to do so. And even when requested um, by colleagues, that many refuse to do it. And... Um, perhaps the biggest problem of all that sits on top of all of us is the specter of publication bias itself, that negative and null results are extremely difficult to publish 
journals often don't want them. Reviewers um, engage in much stricter methodological scrutiny of a study when the findings are negative or disconfirmed predictions. Um, and uh, authors self-censor as well. They know that it's going to be difficult to publish null results. So they will often choose either to not submit them at all and just move on to another study, or um, they'll feel pressure to uh, reanalyze data continually until um, statistical significance is obtained and thus a, uh, a, a true negative could be converted into a false positive. So collectively, you can see that all of these issues really stem or can be thought to stem from uh, pressure to produce certain kinds of results in order to publish and order to have a successful academic career. So how can we break this system? Well, I would like to uh, uh, entertain you with a possible future, which I think is obtainable for all of us, which is one in which firstly, let's just take results out of the equation. Uh, results, I think, are a big problem when they determine our uh, evaluation of quality in science. And really, they've got nothing to do with quality. Research quality can and should be determined, in my opinion, solely based on scientific or re research validity. So the value and importance of the question, the rigor of the methodology, and really never the results that the studies produce. Results should be results. So let's, let's entertain that for a moment, that research quality evaluation should never really take into account results. Secondly, let's imagine a future in which uh, all research that meets a certain quality standard would enter the scientific record at essentially the same level of prominence. So organized by topic or discipline, but essentially a flat landscape of, of a scientific literature. On top of that, let's imagine that all publicly funded research that we're doing uh, would be free to publish and free to read in this scientific literature and would also be associated with open peer review, either signed or anonymous. So we could all see uh, the community's evaluations of that research. And finally, you could ask, well, what role then would journals and academic publishers have within such a landscape? Uh, what, what would their job be um, if they're not you know, organizing the scientific record. And I think we could think of them really primarily as, as existing really to editorialize studies of notes. So we're not as the curators of science or the managers of the process of peer review, um, and certainly not as any kind of thing which adds value by extracting profits from our labor, which is essentially what the academic publishing industry does at the moment. Uh, we do all of the reviewing, we do all of the writing, they extract the profit. So if we can imagine taking them out of that particular bit of the equation, and maybe they could have some kind of role in editorializing or, or highlighting research that's, that's newsworthy. So that's my utopia in which I'd like to aim for. And I'd like to think that we can get there. It's so, it does sound like a bit of a pipe dream, but in fact, we have already started building this. And it began 10 years ago with what we can loosely call registered reports 1.0. So Registered Reports 1.0 tries to solve the problem of results-based evaluation in science. So trying to take away the evaluation of outcomes of research when judging whether research should be published. So there are four central tenets of the Registered Reports model. Firstly, that researchers should decide their hypotheses, if they have any, um, their study procedures and their primary analyses before they commence data collection or analysis. So this is all decided. Um, in line with the hypothetical deductive model of science in which those things should be decided before you see your data. Then a peer review process occurs at that point before the studies are conducted. So we normally peer review, of course, happens at the end of the research after you've done everything and written your paper. But the registered reports model takes that normal process and cuts it in half and says, let's review the front end. Let's review the protocol and the theory and the question and all of that detail first before the, the studies are actually undertaken. And then if that particular process concludes favorably for authors and uh, the, the, the article is accepted, the journal then virtually guarantees publication of the final result, however it turns out. And crucially, when we, when we introduced this at Cortex back in 2013, we made a point of highlighting the fact that we didn't want just this for novel original studies exploring you know, new questions or methods, but also we wanted to encourage um, but replications, important replication studies, because there are already so many disincentives for researchers to engage in replication. 
So for those of you who aren't familiar with the process of how a registered report is evaluated, it begins at what we call stage one, when authors submit a stage one manuscript with an introduction, a methodology that's in proposal form, and a proposed analysis plan, and potentially some analysis of pilot data to confirm proof of concept or uh, establish an effect size for a power analysis or whatever it might be. There's an opportunity to report preliminary studies as well in the stage one submission. This then goes out to stage one peer review where reviewers are essentially assessing the validity of that question and the rigor of the study methodology that is being proposed to answer it. And they're doing this according to specific criteria so that we can um, ensure as much as possible that um, these proposals are being assessed in a rigorous and clear and systematic way. After a normal kind of revision process that you would get at, at any, at any um, journal or platform, um, if the process concludes positively and the protocol's revised to a certain point that it meets all of those criteria, then the journal or the platform offers in principle acceptance or in IPA. And this means that um, when we originally launched this at Cortex, it meant that Cortex would guarantee to publish the eventual results and conclusions of that uh, particular plan, provided the authors uh, conducted it closely in line with uh, what they uh, set out in their protocol. After this, authors have got their IPA. So they know at this point that whatever results they get will not determine whether their paper gets accepted in the end. So they can go away and focus doing the research, safe in the knowledge um, that they can, they can emphasize and focus on quality, purely on quality and doing the research to a high standard. When they've finished their um, study, they complete a stage two manuscript that includes all of the front part of the stage one. So the introduction and the methods, which are virtually unchanged, uh, except for changes in tense, really, because you often shift from future tense to past tense. Then it'll include all of the usual sections that you see in a paper, results, discussion, and open data and materials, usually where that's ethically uh, permissible to do so. Now, one aspect of a registered report, which um, is quite different from a regular paper, is that that result section is separated into two different parts. One reports all of the outcomes of the uh, registered confirmatory analyses, the, the analyses that went through stage one review and were approved prior to any knowledge of the data. And also authors are free to report any unregistered post hoc exploratory analyses, things that they may have thought of after seeing the data, um, which can often shed interesting new lights on a particular question. So the idea here isn't to stifle anyone's freedom to explore their data and to be creative and to find unexpected results in the, in, in the data, but simply to draw a dividing line so that the reader and the author as well is quite clear about which outcomes were bias controlled and determined by the pre-registered plan and which um, were not so bias controlled, but may offer new insights and perhaps raise new questions for the future. This then goes to stage two peer review where reviewers have now, of course, done most of the heavy lifting already. So they've already assessed the theory and the methodology that was in the protocol. So now what they're doing is they're saying, okay, have the authors complied as closely as possible with their protocol? If they had any uh, pre-specified quality checks like positive controls or um, tests on intervention fidelity or other um, reality checks or sanity checks in the data were they passed? And most importantly, are the conclusions based upon the evidence that's presented? And if a manuscript passes those criteria, then it's accepted and published as a stage two registered report. Now, none of these things matter. This is a really important point. With a registered report, with a stage two registered report, and indeed at stage one also, it really in the end didn't matter whether the hypothesis was supported, whether results were statistically significant or not. All of those subjective judgments about novelty and impact and um, you know uh, value and, and timeliness of results and, and conclusions, all of that sort of stuff, it just doesn't matter anymore. This is thrown out of the out of the equation. And we're just simply judging based on theory, methodology, and rigor. So that was 10 years ago that we created, as you, as I say, registered reports 1.0. And in that time, we've seen the format now offered by about 350 journals and rising across a range of fields. So here's a little historical summary um, where it began at Cortex, as I say, back in 2013, in a handful of journals. Cortex primarily publishes 
um, cognitive psychology and neuropsychology and a bit of cognitive neuroscience. It then spread um, to other areas in social and cognitive psychology into um, broader in STEM when it was first launched by uh, the journal Royal Society Open Science. And we've kind of seen a disciplinary expansion across that time with it being taken up by more life sciences and more journals, prominent journals. And perhaps the most prominent journal recently to offer the format was Nature. Um, around this time last year, Nature introduced registered reports for the first time after I'd been badgering them for probably about five years. They finally um, relented and, and uh, decided to offer the format, which I think is a very important step because um, some of the critics early on said that no high impact journal would ever offer the registered reports format because no journal editor at a high impact journal would ever want to take the risk of publishing results that were inconclusive or negative. Um, and in fact, I'm, I'm happy that that criticism turned out to be unfounded and that eventually some of the most high impact journals in, in the world are now offering this format because the editors there recognize um, that quality and value and true impact of science really doesn't arise from whatever fancy story um, authors managed to tease out of their data, but in fact, whether um, the question was important, whether the method was rigorous, and uh, you know w whether the overall program of research can be considered to have value. So now I want to change direction a bit and, and point out some problems, actually, with Registered Reports 1.0. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to go there yet. First of all, I'm going to talk about impacts. Um, are they working? Yes. We can basically say that registered reports are looking very promising uh, in their in their impact so far. So um, these are two recent results which highlight the percentage of null results essentially in registered reports compared to the regular literature. So um, the first study that uh, targeted this was Allen and Mailer in 2019, where they basically evaluated hundreds of hypotheses in registered reports and compared the percentage of null findings compared to the regular literature. And they, what they found is that hypotheses in registered reports are around five times um, more likely to be disconfirmed or, or unsupported um, than in regular articles. Um, now, this is encouraging because we know that there's a huge publication bias in favor of positive results. And in the traditional literature, it's estimated that, you know, around 10, only about 10 to 15 percent of papers report null results in, in the life and social sciences. Um, and so if we're correcting that bias, then we should be seeing a substantially higher rate of null results in registered reports compared to the regular literature. So that's a first encouraging step. If we look at um, psychology more specifically, uh, we see an even more striking results. So this is a, a key study by Anna Scheel and colleagues in which they compared um, the percentage of studies in which the first hypothesis was supported between standard reports and registered reports. They focused on the first hypothesis because the first hypothesis is often uh, in papers the most important one to the authors. Um, and they found that in standard reports, the rate of confirmed hypotheses was around 95%. But in registered reports, it drops to about 45%. So we're seeing a huge reduction there in um, the uh, confirmation rate in registered reports. So in a nutshell, um, if you do a registered report and you go in with a prediction, you, it seems to be that you're much more likely to find out that you were wrong. And there are various ex possible explanations for this. It's possible that Registered reports are being used as a vehicle for testing hypotheses that have a lower prior probability of being true. So researchers might be using them to test risky ideas. But there's another very significant possibility too, which is that a lot of these confirmed positive results here are in fact not real positives at all. And in fact, a large percentage of them, maybe as high as 50%, are false positives. And we're fooling ourselves into seeing what we want to see rather than what's really there and what a registered report is revealing. Further um, outcomes are looking equally promising. So if we look at um, the way researchers themselves evaluate registered reports, we find that on average, um, the quality, the research quality of a registered report is judged to be higher than comparable standard reports. And this key study by Soderberg found basically that um, uh, Expert reviewers evaluated registered reports higher across the board, but particularly um, higher in terms of methodological rigor, quality of methods, and, and how much we'll learn from a study. Um, any, any, any data point to the right of this dotted line is essentially an advantage for registered reports compared to the standard model of publishing. 
um, which is also, I think, an encouraging sign that um, registered reports aren't being used as a way of publishing low quality work. If anything, um, the quality is the same or higher. And the same picture seems to apply for citation rates. So there was a concern early on in the in the uh, 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 launch of registered reports that because in clinical trial research, negative trials are cited substantially less than positive trials, that the same would apply for registered reports, that essentially we the community could systematically ignore them. And... Uh, I was always curious to see whether this would be the case because I felt that in fact, registered reports front load an awful lot of quality that maybe a lot of trials don't. Um, and sure enough, when we look at the, the um, trends in citations, we find that um, registered reports are cited about the same or even possibly slightly higher than regular articles, despite the fact that they're much more likely to contain negative findings. And Finally, we can look at signs of open science within registered reports. We see that they're more likely to be associated with open data, open code, open materials, which is good. And when we look at the data within them, we find that it's easier to reproduce the findings um, that uh, have been archived where that's the case. Although that comes with the caveat that compu computational reproducibility of registered reports is still uh, not as good as it could be. It's um, In this particular study, it was only found to be about 58%. So obviously room to improve there, but still better than the standard literature. So this is where we get to um, where I wanted to get to, which is talking about some of the limitations of this approach. So far, you know, I've set out the fact that we have this big problem with reproducibility and registered reports seem to be working as intended at helping that problem. But the original form of registered reports, the 1.0 model, has a number of quite significant limitations that I've um, became more aware of over the years. And I'm gonna highlight five of them in particular here. The first one, and the, perhaps the main reason why researchers don't engage in registered reports more is the stage one review time. So most of us are in a rush when we're doing science. We, 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 there's a lot of researchers, particularly early career researchers who are on time limited contracts and need to conduct research quite quickly. To have to wait, you know, several months to go to go through a stage one review process and get a plan approved can often be infeasible um, and can often um, set back research enormously, particularly if at some point during that review process, your protocol was rejected and you had to start again somewhere else. The second major limitation is that uh, the format is not particularly well suited to programmatic research. A lot of us do research where we might have a, a, a large program a large plan of multiple parallel arms. This happens a lot in my area and, and in adjacent fields. And ideally, you'd have a model where one stage one registered report could lead to multiple stage two outputs, so multiple stage two registered report articles. Um, but this doesn't actually exist, surprisingly, at any journal, any one of those 350 journals. The current model is a one-to-one -one mapping. So one stage one protocol leads to one stage two registered report output. And this limits the versatility of the format to different areas of investigation. Third, a little bit disappointingly, I've noticed over the last 10 years, and particularly over the last five, as the format has proliferated across journals, is a kind of lowering of editorial standards. And I think this is, you know, in some ways inevitable. As the, as the initiative gets more popular, there's the risk of a bandwagon effect, where journals that perhaps don't have required levels of editorial training and experience want to don't want to miss out on the fun and so they offer the registered reports format but then when they get a submission in they don't quite know what they're doing and the submission isn't handled particularly well um, and so i think um, this naturally uh, is a major problem when you think of it scaling up to hundreds and thousands of journals there needs to be something done about editorial standards a fourth major limitation that applies particularly to those of us who work with existing data is that it's unclear how applicable and how um, useful the registered report format is for those kinds of studies. So if you're if you're analyzing an existing database, as many clinical researchers do, if they're interested in the biobank data set or the human connectome project, or any one of these really large um, cohort studies where you're dipping into an existing archive to, to test a hypothesis, to what extent can registered reports be used actively in that setting. And a lot of journals are very vague about this. They're very clear about, you know, what we might think of as primary registered reports where the data don't exist yet prior to data collection and you're doing experimental work. But what about where that data already exists? 
um, the, a lot of the policies are not well defined and not set out, even though I think there are clear advantages of registered reports in that setting. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, um, at, at the moment, registered reports are offered by journals and journals are largely owned and run by corporate publishers. So it's the publishers and the profit-making enterprise which benefits from all of this work we're doing to make the field more rigorous, to make, to make science more reproducible and more transparent. And that means the power resides with these profit-making you know, organizations and companies rather than with the, the broader scientific community. So what can we do about this? This is where I think we need to start thinking about registered reports differently. We need to start thinking of them as a vehicle for doing something even bigger with the way we uh, peer review and publish science. And I reached the conclusion a few years ago that in fact, if we're going to fix those problems with registered reports as they stand now, we actually have to take registered reports above and beyond journals altogether. And this is where the Peer Community In initiative com comes in. So Peer Community In was, was created um, some years ago now, before, um, before you know, we started getting interested in it. It's been around for a while now as a, a service for um, freely and in a non-commercial context, peer reviewing and recommending preprints. So taking the peer review process and shifting that from journals onto preprints. And there are a number of disciplinary specific um, PCIs in different areas where researchers can submit standard articles for peer review and evaluation. And then, then if those um, preprints are recommended favorably, the whole peer review history is published on the particular PCI website and journals can use those reviews in place of their own. So these are all, as I say, discipline specific and they're for standard kinds of reports only. So what we, we decided to do um, in 2021 was launch the peer community in registered reports. So unlike these um, discipline, specific registered, um, discipline specific PCIs, PCI registered reports acts like a vertical column cutting across all of these fields. It's not specific for any one field, but it is specific for the registered reports article type. And so the idea here is to take um, the, the benefits of this kind of community review and apply them specifically to registered reports so that we can shift evaluation to the preprint stage. And so this is what ended up being the result of that process. So PCIRR, as I say, a free non-commercial platform which reviews and recommends registered reports preprints across basically all fields, across STEM, medicine, social sciences, and even humanities. And then... Once a submission is recommended by PCIRR, following in-depth review by the same academic community that would be engaged to review at a journal, um, the, basically the manuscript, the stage one manuscript, and eventually the stage two manuscript is posted at the preprint server. So updates are posted. Um, and then if, it's the, if the process ends favorably for the authors, then the reviews and the editorial recommendation are published on the PCIRR website. So you can see that PCI registered reports is not a journal. OK, so it doesn't, you know, publish articles like a journal does. It simply peer reviews preprints and then publishes those reviews and recommendations. And then this is where it gets interesting. So because the peer review has already been done, there's then a list of what we call PCI RR friendly journals that commit to accepting um, the evaluations and the recommendations of PCI registered reports without further peer review. So that means that these journals agree for the PCI RR evaluation process to replace the peer review process that would have taken place had the authors instead gone to uh, that journal. I'll skip this slide since it just really outlines this procedure in more detail. And I'll get to this one. So this lists the current um, setting of PCI friendly journals. So there's uh, currently 33 registered reports friendly journals. So these are the journals which commit to accepting PCI RR recommendations without further peer review. And in, in amongst these journals, there's the journal Cortex, which was the founding journal for registered reports and a number of other um, journals um, in different areas. And then over here, you'll see that there's some journals called PCI registered reports interested journals. So these are journals which don't share the same, necessarily the same um, evaluation criteria as PCI registered reports. And so they reserve the right to perform additional peer review. Um, but um, they often are watching closely and they get um, alerts to new recommendations. And they reach out often and make offers to authors when they find something of, of interest. 
So to collectively, you can see that this completely turns the table on the typical publishing process because you can go through one registered reports gateway for peer review. And then from that, you can choose which journal will publish your, which friendly journal will publish your eventual stage two registered report without further peer review. But you can also wait and see if one of these um, interested journals wants to pick up your submission. So rather than going from one journal at a time, to, you know, through the, the process and spending a lot of time doing that, um, you can go through one centralized preprint based review system. And then give, it gives you, the author, a lot more power to decide the fate of your submission. And this list on the left of friendly journals is growing all of the time, um, which is really important. So we're getting, you know, more journals joining it all the time, which every time a new journal comes on board, um, it increases the the uh, the attractiveness of submitting to the PCI registered reports platform rather than going individually to each of those journals. Now, we also introduced some other unique features. So because PCI is a community run initiative and it's not owned by a publisher with a uh, any sort of profit-making motivation, we can design features and build features into this that serve our needs most precisely and you know, in, the, in the most constructive way possible. One of those unique features is programmatic registered reports. So these are submissions in which one stage one manuscript can lead to multiple stage two outputs. So researchers can have a stage one protocol in which there are multiple arms that will be undertaken either simultaneously or sequentially and then if that overall package gets reviewed and recommended favorably, each of those individual outputs is also approved at the same time. So it's a great way for researchers to go through one centralized preprint based process for a peer review that leads very efficiently to a number of accepted articles in advance. So great for, you know, if you're an early career researcher or doing a PhD or a postdoc to really use this to maximize the efficiency of peer review. But the real game changer, I think, is scheduled review. So I, there's no question that the big limitation researchers face in engaging with registered reports is that stage one review time. And I was thinking some years ago at how we could possibly solve this problem because the review process is, you know, is already heavily burdened. Reviewers already work as fast as they can given all of the, the other kind of burdens and, and, and responsibilities that we all have in this job. And actually, the solution isn't for reviewers to work any harder than they normally do. It's to stop doing things in serial. Serial is very slow. So this is the standard review process involves authors preparing a stage one manuscript completely, then submitting it to the to PCI registered reports. And then there's a triage process and there's acquiring reviewers. And then, you know, that takes quite a bit of time often to find reviewers. And then there's the review process after that. And you add up all of these kind of chunks of time sequentially, and that's how long it takes to go through the stage one review process. But in fact, we can speed this up enormously simply by doing certain aspects in parallel. So with the scheduled review track, what authors do is they prepare what we call a registered report snapshot. It's like a one page summary of what the stage one manuscript will be eventually. So it outlines the question, the basic methodology, the hypotheses and so on, but in a one page format. So this snapshot is, is submitted, is, is posted on a preprint server or on the OSF and then it, it, the link is submitted to PCI registered reports where it goes through a triage process. And if it passes that initial desk, then what the recommender does is acquire reviewers for the future. So this is while the authors are now writing the manuscript. They haven't even started their manuscript yet, but they're now writing their manuscript at the same time that the recommender is acquiring reviewers for the future based on the snapshot. And then what we do is we plan that review process for the future. So maybe six to eight weeks ahead. And we plan it to happen during a narrow window of time. Um, and it turns out to be super efficient. So if you go through this process, on average, um, we've shortened this dotted red line from, um, you know, eight weeks, perhaps potentially more, right down to 18 days, uh, which is a big time saver. And I think helps to overcome that major problem of stage one review time. And crucially, it's doing it without trading off on quality because the reviewers are still spending the same amount of time as they would evaluating the stage one submission. But they're just doing it at a point in time in the future when they've ring fenced that time in advance rather than it coming in and having to respond to it reactively and try and find time and then being late and so on. Another innovation that we've introduced at PCI Registered Reports is to create a taxonomy 
of bias control for situations in which researchers are analyzing existing data. So as I said earlier, one of the major limitations with registered reports 1.0 is that there are essentially only two kinds of registered report. There's primary registered reports where data don't yet exist until you get stage one acceptance. And then there's the there's this vague world where data exists in some way and journals are not particularly clear about how much of that data you can have observed before you, to be eligible for a registered report, if any at all. How does it work? Will they take these articles? You know, there's just it's just a world of ambiguity and uncertainty. So what we decided to do was create um, a six level taxonomy in which at the top at level six is the primary registered report. This is the standard, the classical one where data do not exist prior to in principle acceptance. And that means the risk of bias due to prior data observation is by definition zero because those data don't exist. But also, you know, it's worth noting that the multidisciplinary inclusivity is also very low. So this, this particular model of registered report is not applicable to a lot of situations, particularly researchers who are dealing with um, a, entirely with existing cohorts or entire fields, which by definition must um, uh, uh, work with retrospective data. If you're a certain type of economist or a political scientist or historian, there's no way you're going to be generating new data at all. And I think it doesn't make sense to exclude registered reports and the rigor they bring from entire areas of research. Then what we do is we take all of the cases in which, reg in which data does exist and we divide them into five different levels from five down to one. Um, ranging from level five, where you know all of the data or evidence that is used to answer the question already exists, but they are provably inaccessible to the authors. So perhaps they're held by a gatekeeper. Perhaps there's a there's way, there's a way that you can prove that you have not had any access to that data. All the way down to situations where um, data do exist, but authors self-certify that they haven't seen it, where it exists, but they have seen some of it but they've not seen the key data or the key variables all the way down to level one where they have seen um, some of the data and some of the key variables, but they certify that they haven't undertaken any of the analyses. And as you can imagine, as you go down this, this kind of um, taxonomy, um, the risk of bias due to um, prior data observation increases, but equally the disciplinary inclusivity also increases. So researchers in areas like ecology, for example, can submit registered reports now to PCIRR that they wouldn't have been able to uh, if there was only a, a, a level six, for instance, being offered. So I wanna finish by giving you an example of how you can use um, this combination of, uh, of features to your advantage. So let's imagine you're a postdoc or an early career researcher, a PhD student, for example, planning to do a series of independent registered reports. What you can do is begin by designing your studies and then completing a stage one snapshot for the scheduled review track. So you post this on the OSF and you can do this publicly or under a private embargo. And then you submit that snapshot URL to PCI registered reports using um, the scheduled review track. And in doing so, you select a future date for review, say two months ahead. And then once it passes the recommended triage process, you get to work writing your full programmatic registered report, which will have multiple different studies within it. Now, while you're designing and writing this registered report, you're also consulting the list of PCI-friendly journals to make sure that if they have any additional requirements, um, such as a high level of power or a particular minimum level of bias control or whatever it might be, these are all defined clearly um, on the PCI registered reports page. If there are any particular requirements you need to meet to publish in those journals, that you meet them in the uh, manuscript that you're, you're writing. And then when the, the due date comes around, you submit your full programmatic stage one submission. And then because that review process has been planned in advance whilst you're doing all that writing and planning, you can expect to get an interim recommendation within about two to three weeks. You'll then probably get an invitation to revise. And then um, if you eventually go through that and get in principle acceptance, PCI registered reports will tell you which journals are eligible outlets and therefore will auto endorse that IPA decision. Uh, and you can also ask for a steer from the PCI managing board prior to that, if you want to know which journals would be suitable. Now you have your in-principle acceptance in hand, and you also have a, an approved program of multiple stage two registered reports accepted at um, you know, any one of those eligible, eligible journals, or indeed any other journal that you wish to submit to. You don't, you don't have to submit 
at a PCI friendly journal. It's just there as an insurance policy if you want to. Then you simply do your research and publish each stage two output as you go. And each one will be re reviewed by PCI registered reports that will go through a stage two process. Um, but the journal won't redo the peer review if you go to one of the friendly journals. And then, of course, you can publish in a journal of your choice at the end. Here is an actual concrete example of researchers going through this, which um, includes authors who are in the audience today, like Katerina and Lear. Um, there are two stage two registered reports in this particular submission. Um, one was a behavioral study and the other was a neuroimaging study. Um, we had three expert reviewers who provided evaluation over two rounds. And you can see that first round, which was scheduled eight weeks in advance, took nine days to complete, was very thorough, very rigorous. Then there was a second round, which took 28 days. And then there was a desk evaluation. So the total time spent in stage one review for this particular programmatic submission was about six weeks. Finally, my very last thing I want to say is that we can think about taking this kind of 2.0 model of registered reports far beyond journals. So here is a situation in which um, many of the friendly journals also have an internal registered reports track. And so at Cortex, for example, up until November 2022, you could submit to Cortex directly as your registered report, or you could submit to PCI registered reports, and either one of those tracks could be used to publish in Cortex. But before I left the Cortex editorial board, I made sure to do one important thing, which was to close down the internal registered reports track, except for very special cases. And that's because I think it's it's crucial that um, we try and take back as much control of this review process and make it as community driven as possible and encourage authors to use community based review as much as we can. And so we the journal that founded registered reports now basically doesn't offer them as an internal track. Instead, if you want to publish in Cortex, and you're welcome to, what you do is you submit to PCI registered reports, go through the rigorous evaluation there, and then you can choose Cortex as an output journal where, if it's determined to be PCI RR friendly. And I'd like to see more journals um, taking this approach too. And eventually perhaps we could get rid of journal-based peer review altogether for all types of articles and simply do all peer review at the community level. And then we could finally make academic publishers work for us rather than the other way around. If you'd like more information, here's a number of links. All these slides are available here on my talks page. Um, you can find information for authors, FAQs. If you're a if you're a journal editor and you'd like to join us, um, there's so many great reasons to join and become um, a recommender and for your journal to become PCI friendly, then do get in touch. Um, and most importantly, perhaps if you're considering um, writing a registered report or using PCI registered reports, um, you can uh, find loads of examples of um, recommended stage one and stage two preprints and uh, on the PCI RR pages. When you see full review histories, um, you can see every every step of the way, you can follow it and you can see the final preprint that was recommended and, and uh, by the platform. And many of those at stage two have gone on, of course, to be published in journals. So I will leave it at that and um, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you again for your time today.